Alrighty, welcome back. Today I want to go ahead and do some review because the stuff that I'm going to review with you all is going to be relevant for semester two. So what we're going to go ahead and do in this video is I'm going to go ahead and show you how to simplify fractions, round, uh, do some algebra review and some other things that we've already covered in semester one, which will be relevant for semester two. So I have this fraction over here. This is example one. 4 divided by 2. Well, you can't leave your answer like this, right? 4 over 2, which, you know, 4 divided by 2 is simply just 2, right? And I'm going to start off with this very, very basic problem because 4 divided by 2 can be simplified to 2, right? So, if you can obviously see it, well, what number goes into... 4 and 2 at the same time. Well, I'm thinking 2, right? 2 goes into 4 and 2 obviously goes into 2, right? So I can just divide both sides by 2 here. And I can get, you know, 2 over 1. And that will be my answer. Or you can just simply put that in the calculator. And obviously you'll just get, you know, 2. Okay? Um, that's very, very basic, right? But, um... What I'm going to show you is sometimes when we progress through, you know, other types of fractions, you're not going to get something like 4 over 2. Um, I'm going to show you something called the greatest common factor. And basically what I'm going to go ahead and do is I look at this 4 and I look at this 2. I'm going to write 4 and 2 right there and then put a colon next to them each, okay? And what I'm basically trying to do is I'm going to figure out numbers that will go into, well, specifically four here. I'm going to think of some numbers that will go into four, right? So what goes into four? Well, I know that one is going to go into four because one times four is four. So basically what I'm trying to say is one goes into four, four times. So one times four is four. So it's going to be part of my list. And I know another one. I know another number that goes into 4. That's basically 2. 2 goes into 4. How many times does 2 go into, go into 4? Uh, 2 goes into 4 twice. And then another one would be just 4 because 4 goes into 4 one time. Okay? And I already wrote my 1 here, so I don't need to write that again. Let's take a look at this 2 here. What number goes into 2? 1, because 1 goes into 2 twice, and then 2 goes into 2 once. So 1 and 2 are my factors of 2. All right? So what about 3, 4, 5? Well, if I were to say 3, well, 3 is not going to go into 2, obviously. It's, a, it's greater than 2. 4 is not going to go into 2. 5 is not going to go into 2. I stop at whatever number uh, appears uh, for, you know, whatever's under this number and that number there is, okay? Or there are. Um, so now I'm going to, so I already got my factors, right? Let's go ahead and take a look at common factors. And I'm just basically comparing this list to this list. What do they share in common? Well, they both share a 1 and they both share a 2. They don't share a 4 whatsoever, okay? So I already have my factors and I have my common factors and the common factors here are 1 and 2, okay? So now, the question here is, what does it mean for something to be the greatest common factor? Well, if I compare, so I have my common factors here, and essentially, I am trying to look at one and two. What is obviously the larger number in this, you know, uh, you know, with this? Uh, 1 and 2, well, 2 is obviously larger than 1, so what does that crown that? That means that 2, that means that 2 
is my GCF, or greatest common factor in this case, okay? So that's my greatest common factor. So what am I going to do with that too? I'm going to go back to that original problem, and then I'm going to put a division sign here and a division sign here, okay? Oops, I already spoiled it. So this two, that two is going to go here and also here, okay? This is where I put my GCF. This is where I put my GCF, okay? So four divided by two is two, and then two divided by two is one. So the answer in this case is two over one, okay? So that's how the GCF works in this case. Let's do another problem. Example two, three over six. If you can see it, you know that three goes into three and three goes into six, but I'm gonna go ahead and write my list again. So a three and a six, and a one goes into three, and then three goes into three, and then one goes into six, two goes into six. How many times does two go into six? Three times. So that means three should be part of that list as well. So I have my factors. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at my common factors. So I can see that they both carry a one and they both share a three. So I'm gonna write one and three. So what is the greatest common factor? What's the largest number in this case? Uh, it's not one, it's gonna be three. Three is obviously greater than one. So the GCF is three. So now I'm gonna go back to my problem. I'm gonna divide, divide, introduce the GCF here in here and say, okay, three divided by three is one. Six divided by three, let's put that in the calculator, is two, okay? So the answer is one half, okay? All right, example three, six over eight. Um, I'm gonna write six and eight. I'm gonna think of some things go into six I have one one goes into six two goes into six three goes into six what about four does four go into six no what about five nope six yes six goes into six one time and then eight I got one goes into eight two goes into eight does three go into eight nope four yes four goes into eight evenly so four times two is eight six six doesn't go into eight evenly seven that's an odd number eight yes eight goes into eight one time okay so i have my factors let's take a look at the common factors they both share a one they both share a two um what else here did they both share three no six no four no eight no so i have one and two these are my common factors so what's the greatest common factor it is indeed two so i write gcf is two the gcf here is two so i'll go back to my original problem write a division sign there division sign there two Two, six divided by two is three. Eight divided by two is four. Your answer is three divided by four. Three over four. So that means that this is your answer in simplified form. Okay. All right. What I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to introduce the break apart and cancel methods. We're not going to do the GCF, but it does look like we are doing the GCF, but it's just breaking the the numbers apart and then canceling if they have or specifically the top and bottom have some things in common okay so i'm gonna go ahead and take a look at this um here's example four i got 15 over 24 and you can see that this is an odd and this is a even number um, it is always important that you really, really, really be careful 
and ensure that this is simplified, okay? You can see that this is odd, this is even, doesn't mean that this is already simplified. Make sure that you check and ensure it is. So I'm going to look at this 15, right? And look at this 15. I know two numbers that multiply together, that'll give me 15. I can break this 15 apart as five times three, because five times three is 15. And then I look at this, I have this 24 here, that's basically eight times three, okay? And notice the top and the bottom, or specifically I have the numerator here, okay? And remember the numerator is the top part of the fraction, and this is the denominator, the bottom part of the fraction. And you can see that they both carry a three. When you have numbers multiplied in the top and numbers multiplied in the bottom, and you see the same numbers here, you can obviously cancel them out. So I'm gonna cancel that three out and cancel that three out. What am I left with? I'm left with five over eight, okay? So I'm left with five over eight. Um, is this simplified? Well, let's see, five, I'm gonna do the same thing. So five times one is five, and then eight times, sorry, uh, Eight can be broken into like four times two, which I can keep on going. This four, I can break that apart. It's two times two times two. And then I look at the top and bottom, I'm like, okay, well, it appears that I cannot cancel anything top and bottom. So what does this mean for five over eight? This stuff is unnecessary now, and your answer is just 5 over 8. Okay, that's going to be 5 over 8. That's simplified. Great. Um, let's go ahead and do another one. We're going to do that break apart and cancel. I have 35 over 49. So I'm going to write my division bar. 35 can be broken into 7 times 5. 7 times 5 is 35. And then 49 is 7 times 7. 49 is a perfect square. So if I do the square root of 49, y'all, that's going to give me 7. Okay? Uh, so 7 times 7. Look at that. You can see the top and bottom, they both share a 7. So that goes away. That goes away. And then uh, just because I want to, I just want to make sure we're all clear. Just because you see a 7 here and there's two 7s in the denominator you do not cancel uh one up one up top and then two in the bottom that's not how it works you cancel one at a time if there is another seven here then yes you can cancel the seven here okay but since there's one seven up top and two sevens in the bottom then you're going to just cancel one of the sevens here okay hopefully that makes sense so that's going to give you five sorry five over seven and that's your answer okay that's your answer uh here's some more examples and what i'm going to go ahead and do with these examples is essentially if i can see what number goes into you you know the top and bottom then that's what i'm going to do i'm just gonna not i'm not gonna use this method here and i'm not going to use this method here but those are just fundamentals that will help you just be more confident confident with simplifying fractions because if i were to look at 9 over 45 i can see that 9 goes into 9 and 9 goes into 45 at the same time right so divide by 9 here divide by 9 here i'm not doing the gcf and i'm not going to break it apart and cancel i can just see it okay so 9 divided by 9 is 1, 45 divided by 9 is 5, okay? 1 over 5. Now, I'm going to go back, because let's say that, uh, let's say that, you know, that 3 goes into 9, and 3 goes into 45 at the same time, right? Well, 9 divided by 3 is 3, and 45 divided by 3 is 15. If I were to look at this 3 over 15, is this simplified? 
Well, no, because I have to keep on going. This, you, remember, simplification, when you're simplifying, you're performing all the operations until you no longer can. In this case, I have to simplify this fraction, okay? This is not simplified whatsoever because I know that if I were to look at it, three goes into three and three goes into 15. So three divided by three is one and 15 divided by three is um, five. So the answer, right, if, if I were to do the same thing, if I were to divide by nine here and divide by nine here, sorry, I need to get rid of that division bar. Uh, nine divided by nine was one and then 45 divided by nine is five. So this was the faster route and this here was I had to keep on going until I no longer can perform any simplifications whatsoever, okay? So the answer here is indeed one over five, right? So make sure that you be careful, 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 careful with how you're simplifying this. You have to keep on going until you no longer can, okay? I'm gonna erase this so I have more room to do the second problem. Um, I can see for 36 over 18, 18 does go into 36, right? So if I divide both sides by 18, Y'all, that's gonna give you what? Two over one, okay? So the GCF in this case was just 18. And then here, five divided by 15, y'all, I don't even have to write anything other than the answer because I'm gonna simplify that as one over three. That's your answer, okay? All righty, let's go ahead and proceed to the next slide, rounding. I have 65.724 and you can see that we are dealing with a lot of digits here and what rounding does is we're going to basically make numbers look a lot nicer to look at and see okay so 65.724 I have broken this number down to show you the place values, right? So here are my digits. I have six, five, a decimal, seven, two, four. Now, this little dot or this point here, this is what we call a decimal, okay? And um, the number to the left hand side of the decimal is what we call the nearest hole. The number to the right of the decimal, we call that the tenths place. And then over here, after the tenths place, we call that the hundredths place. And then we got the thousandths place, which is always after the hundredths place, okay? So we have 65.724. Now the rule of rounding is pretty simple. We say that if the number you are rounding is followed by five or more, you're going to round that number up. If it's below that five, that number is actually going to remain the same. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples here. I have the directions and it says that you're gonna to round to the nearest whole number. So remember, the whole, the nearest whole will always be the uh, one place after the decimal one to the left so i have this decimal here i look to the left one that's the nearest hole so if i go over here i'm gonna round to the nearest hole i'm gonna go find that decimal here's my decimal and then right next to it to the left hand side you have the nearest hole so this three is either going to stay the same or move up one so what do I do? Well, the number followed by three, the nearest toll is actually five. So this five here is going to dictate whether or not, so this five here is going to dictate whether or not that three is going to stay the same or move up one. And if I go back to that rule, if the number you are rounding is followed by five or more, you're going to round the number up. So this five is indeed five or more. So three, is it going to stay the same or is it going to move up one? Well, since five is five or more, this three is going to become, is going to become 4.0 or just four, okay? 
So that's what happens to that. So that's what happened to the three. It you just add one, and you get four. Now the question here is, what happens to the five and the one? They go away. Let's take a look at another example. I have 0 0.93. So again, I'm going to round to the nearest whole number. So the number, or if I look at the decimal here, uh, to the left is my nearest whole. It's a zero, and it's followed by this nine. Know that nine is indeed five or more. So then it does change that zero to a one. So 0 0.93 is, is approximately 1. And if I were to look at C, okay, again, I'm going to round to the nearest whole number. Here's the decimal. And then to the left, that's my nearest whole. And it's followed by this 2. So what does the 2 do to the 5? Well, again, if the number you are rounding is followed by 5 or more, then you round the number up. Because 2 is not 5 or more, it's below 5, then this 5 is actually going to remain the same. So it's approximately 5. And then the numbers after that will go away. So that it's going to be approximately 5. Let's take a look at some examples where we're going to be dealing with rounding to the nearest tenths. So... Here's my decimal, and the tenths place is right after the decimal, like to the right, just by one. So this is the tenths place, right after the decimal. So here I have 0 0.245. Here's the decimal. This is the tenths place, and it's followed by this 4. So this four is going to dictate whether or not that two, remain the sa two remains the same or it moves up by one. Since four is not five or more, this two here is going to remain the same. So it's approximately 0 0.2. And then these numbers here, they go away. So it's approximately 0 0.2. For B, I have 4.75. This is my decimal, this is the tenths place. What does the number followed by seven do to that seven? Well, seven, I have 0.75. Um, know that this number is five or more. So it's actually going to change that seven to an eight. So it's approximately 4.8 and that five goes away. Last problem, round to the nearest hundredths. I have 101.256. So the hundredths place, it's two places after the decimal to the right. So this is the tenths place, and then this is the hundredths place. So here, this is my decimal. I have the tenths place, that's the hundredths place. I'm going to round to the nearest hundredths so I'm taking a look at this number, right? Again, this is my hundredth place. This number is going to dictate whether or not that five remains the same or moves up by one. And since six is indeed five or more, that six is going to change that five to a six. So it's going to be approximately 101 point two six and then this six here goes away so that's basically rounding all right on the next slide what i want to do is do some algebra review with you all um, we're going to be doing algebra involving fractions and i know that we've been doing a few of those in the first semester, but we're gonna be doing a lot of those in the second semester. Knowing how to do the basics will prepare you for what's gonna be coming. So uh, 3x over two is equal to four. So remember with the algebra rules, we have to do the inverse operations and solve for x, all that sort of thing. I got 3x divided by two. 
equals 4. Now 3x divided by 2, or 3x over 2, notice that I said divide by. Well, what's the opposite of division? Well, the opposite of division is multiplication. So if I were to multiply, and how I'm gonna do this is, I'm gonna use a different color for this one. I'm going to multiply and showing that multiplication sign by using, by using parentheses here. I'm going to multiply both sides by a particular number. What is that particular number? Well, it's always going to be the denominator, the bottom of the fraction. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. So I'm going to put a 2 here and I'll put a 2 here. So then what happens to these two 2s? Well, they're going to go away. They cancel. So I'm left with 3x. It's going to be by itself. And I set that equal to 4 times 2. 4 times 2 is simply just 8. So now I have 3x, which is the same thing as saying 3 times x. The opposite of multiplication will be division. So I need to divide both sides by 3. So x is equal to 8 divided by 3. Since x is equal to 8 over 3, 8 over, th 8 over 3 is a fraction. The question is, is it simplified? Well, I can't think of any number that goes into 8 and 3 at the same time. So that means that x is equal to 8 over 3 is indeed simplified. Okay? So 8 over 3 is indeed simplified. So that means that this is my answer. Let's take a look at this other problem here. I got 10x plus 1 over 4 is equal to 9. So we can see that 10x plus 1 over 4, that's division. So I need to multiply both sides by 4, just like so. So then that means that these two 4s cancel. And I have 10x plus 1 and I set that equal to, or you're not setting it, it's going to be equal to 9 times 4, which is 36. You want to solve for x, so you're going to minus 1 on both sides. So, so 10x is equal to 35, so x is equal to 35 over 10. Now, is that your answer? 35 over 10. Well, this is not simplified. 35 over 10 there's a number that goes into those two numbers, right? Um, and that's 5, right? 5 goes into 35 and 5 goes into 10 at the same time, okay? So I'm going to divide both sides by 5. I get 7, so I get 7 over 2. Now if I wanted to, let me go ahead and show you how to simplify fractions using a calculator. All right, so the first step is write the non-simplified fraction into the calculator. In this case, I have 35 divided by 10. Now I'm gonna press the enter button and you're going to get a decimal, 3.5. That's wonderful. What I'm going to do or what I'm going to demonstrate is you're gonna convert this decimal into a simplified fraction. So the first step was to put the non-simplified fraction into the calculator. So now you should get a decimal, and then you're going to convert that decimal into a simplified fraction. And to do that is I need you to pay attention to where the math button is. And it's located to the right of this arrow using my um, laser pointer here. You should see the math button on your calculator, which is under the alpha button. So you're going to press math. And notice that you have all these options here. You got frac decimal, x cube, and so on and so forth. What you need to highlight and make sure of that it's highlighting that fraction button. Number one, okay, the number one button up top. You're gonna press on, the, you're gonna press the enter key and you should see answer. The answer in this case is 3.5. It's going to convert, hence that little arrow there, to a fraction. Once you get to that stage, press enter. So look at that. Your answer is 7 over 2. Okay? 
The answer is seven over two. That's the answer, that's what we want. Let me go back to the previous problems and do some more examples. I have this, let's say nine over 45, right? So I'm gonna write nine divided by 45. I'm gonna hit enter, press the math key, then the fraction button, hit enter. Does it give me that answer one over five? Yes, it does. So one over five is indeed the answer. And we can do the same thing for five over 15, five divided by 15, press the math button, hit enter, enter one third. That's exactly what I had on the, uh, the app here, the notepad here, okay? So that's how you can simplify fractions using your calculator. All right, let's go ahead and review some stuff from semester one. I have alternate interior angle, which states that if two lines that are parallel are cut by a transversal, then the alternate interior angles are equal or congruent. So if I were to introduce these two lines that are parallel and they are cut by a transversal, then the alternate interior angles are congruent. So this is an example of alternate interior angles, which will show up from time to time this semester. I have vertical angles here. When two lines intersect, the angles opposite to each other are equal or congruent. So let me draw these two lines that intersect. They form an X. So that, that means that the angles across from each other are congruent. So those are vertical angles. I have a parallelogram and typically parallelograms are quadrilaterals and quadrilaterals are four-sided figures. So if I were to show you these properties here, one of them is opposite sides are parallel, opposite sides are congruent, opposite angles are congruent, and the diagonals, are, uh, the diagonals bisect each other. I don't remember if that's gonna be relevant, but just in case, diagonals bisect each other at a midpoint and splits those segments into two congruent parts. So don't forget about that. Uh, let me go ahead and draw a parallelogram. It's quadrilateral, it's a four-sided figure. Again, we have opposite sides are parallel. Remember those arrows indicate parallel. So I have that opposite sides parallel, opposite sides are congruent. These tick marks represent congruency. Opposite angles are congruent. So these arcs represent congruency in terms of angle. And then I'm gonna use my, uh, I'm not gonna draw it with my pen, but I'm gonna use my uh, laser pointer. The diagonals bisect each other at a midpoint, which means that, hey, this is the midpoint of this segment. So I'm gonna draw a tick mark here and a tick mark here. And this midpoint is going to apply to this segment here as well. So instead of drawing one tick mark, I draw two tick marks. Because we don't know if those diagonals are congruent unless it is a square or a rectangle. But in this case, a parallelogram is just, it's generic. So we're just going to do it this way.